Kids are cute, aren't they? You know, the first gathering, there was a very cute kid who had a, a lisp, because children are cute when they have a lisp. And instead of saying holy scriptures, he said holy sweatshirts. And I thought that was amazing. <laughs> I thought that was amazing. I was like, that's, that's our new market right there, holy sweatshirts. Hey, if, uh, if we haven't met yet, my name is Kyle. I'm a lead pastor here. And one of the ways I've been inviting people to connect with me uh, is through this slide right here. I often engage on social media a little bit better on Facebook, uh, on Instagram. Uh, I'm not on TikTok yet, and mostly because I'm not interesting enough to be on TikTok, so that's why I'm not on there. But all of these ways are ways for me to connect with you. If you email me or something like that, I might take a little bit longer. So this is just an, another way for us to connect, and I would love to do that. I don't always get to, to participate in conversations or get to meet and know all of you, so it's just my attempt to do so. And so I hope you'll take advantage of it. <clears throat> for those of you who have, I've really enjoyed connecting and praying with you. So that's been pretty cool. So we're in the series <clears throat> called... Um, I should know, I wrote the series, Jesus Continued, which is the next slide right there, Jesus Continued, the beginning and building of the church. And so we tried to spend the month of April, only four weeks, talking about so many books in the Bible. If you didn't know, we are in this year-long series, which we began May of last year, and which will end May of this year. <clears throat> and so we've got one more month left. And so the, the, the month of April, we've tried to tackle the epistles and the acts and a bunch of other stuff. And it's really hard to just choose a small uh, portion of books to, to do thematically. And one of the reasons we did that was we wanted to encourage you to read yourself as well. And so as we continue to teach on this series that we will hopefully coincide with some of the things that you're reading as you're reading through the Bible. And then next month, uh, we're going to do one of my favorite books. I've only taught it of a couple times, uh, mostly because it's, it's, it can seem complicated, but we're going to do the book of Revelation. So we're going to end our series in May, <clears throat> Revelation. You are not going to want to miss this series, especially week one, which starts uh, next Sunday. We've got something special lined up for you. And we're going to try to do almost like a master's class of how to read the Bible, but particularly how to read Revelation, because all sorts of people have opinions on them. All sorts of people have bad opinions on, on Revelation and how it happens. And it's actually a more simplistic book to read than maybe you think. And so it actually is going to be entirely applicable to you. And you'll find that out week one is why the uniqueness of this book. And it, it tells us that in the first chapter. And so we'll get there. But today, we're going to continue on in our Jesus Continued series. And today, I want to talk about something kind of challenging. It's unity and diversity in the church. Unity and diversity in the church. One of the things that makes the church so unique are these two things. And the first one is much harder than the second one. Diversity often happens because if you were to do some research, you'd actually find that Christianity is actually the only true world religion. And most people tend to emphasize the true part than the world part, is that most religions in the world are highly centered around their origins. So Judaism is, is more on the, the Fertile Crescent, and then you've got Islam um, in some of the, those countries as well, the, to the east of there. And then you have Christianity, which has kind of exploded throughout the whole world and is in almost every part of the world. Part of that is that Christianity is an evangelistic uh, religion, meaning we want to go and spread the good news, and not every religion is that way. But I think part of the reason that is, is that Christianity is unique, is it tries to take the best uh, of culture, and it doesn't, it doesn't try to help uh, everyone say that, no, you're about to put your culture down in order to become a Christian. It survives and thrives in culture while also engaging and sometimes being against culture. And so people from all walks of life and uh, all different types of religions they come from, ages and areas of the world, they, they often flock to Christianity because of what Jesus provides to people. But when you do that, when you have such a diverse group of people, it's really hard to be unified. It's really hard to be unified. We could say it this way. One of the most challenging things about life is to have unity and diversity in a community. If you're, let me give you a few examples. You know, a lot of us really enjoy sports. And so some of us enjoy the Raiders and some of us enjoy the 49ers and some of us enjoy the Dodgers and most of us hate the Dodgers. Hopefully that's going to be happening. I'm an Angels fan, so I can say that. Um, some of us love cats and some of us love every other animal besides cats. And if you think I've been picking on cat people, um, I haven't done that in a while, so I figured I'd pick it back up uh, because I've been more mean to the Raiders fans, but football season is over, and so I behaved myself. I could have said people love the Raiders or people love winning, but I didn't say that today. I didn't say that. So I, I showed self-control. Um, and for cat people, you guys get me back. If you didn't know this, it's just, this has nothing to do with the message. Um, the cat people, they give me cat mugs. I've been given uh, cat cards that say love from all the cat people. Threw it away immediately. No, I'm just kidding. It sits on my desk. And I also was given a cat onesie to wear at Christmas. So 
Cat people bring it on, do not clap for them. Cat people bring it on themselves. So the whole portion is that even in our church, we've got a plethora of interests. We've got a plethora of nationalities, of, of, of beliefs, of age groups, of just stages of life. So how do you have unity amidst that diversity? And why is that so important? I mean, even this year, to get serious for a second, we're going to have another election. And I'm sure we're all going to behave ourselves and be nice to one another through that. And I, I'm just going to talk today about Christians rather than the world, because realistically, that's only, you know, our areas of purview, and especially here as we're in church today. And, and that is the insistence that Jesus has as Christians live within the world. So I want to talk about unity and diversity within community because it's very, very challenging. And I want to say this about it. Being unified is only possible through God, and being diversified is a gift from God. So I really do think if it was just up to us, you know, we would misbehave. We would find all sorts of ways to divide ourselves. And we have. And part of the reason it took me so long to become a Christian is I was like, you guys don't even like each other, you Christians. Why would I join? You know, or you guys have a diversity of beliefs. You can't even agree. What are you going to give to me? And as I become, became a Christian and as I you know, started getting more engaged in the church, I realized some of the highlighted differences were things that weren't as important as the unifying presence of Jesus Christ and all the other stuff we're going to look at in Scripture. And I also loved the diversity uh, in a church because it, I was like, how are all these people from different walks of life and, and different you know, financial statuses and different marital statuses and different nationalities, why would they all together worship one God? And it was very interesting to me. But unity is a, actually a very, very big deal, especially to Jesus. And so I'm going to take you to John chapter 17. So John chapters 14 to 16, Jesus is essentially saying to his disciples, hey, I'm going away. And it's a really kind of like enlightening but sad chapter. And Jesus talks a lot with his disciples because he's trying to prepare them for the time that he is going to leave. And the disciples have a mixture of fear because they don't know what's going to happen uh, when he leaves, disbelief, they're not sure what he means when he goes, even though he's told them a bunch of times. And then also they're just, they're sad because they really loved and cared about Jesus. And now he's talking about going away. And in this like massive discourse that he has with them, he encourages them. He talks with them. He promises them that he will bring another with them or give another to them like himself, meaning the Holy Spirit, and he will always be with them. And then towards the end, he prays for something that's so important. He basically gives this, this big message, a mission. He tells them it's going to be difficult. Difficult, and they're not, they're, they have no idea how difficult it's going to be. But he says, all throughout it, you need to have unity. And here's what he says. He says, I pray not only for these, I mean, these disciples who are sitting here, but also for those who believe in me through their word. That would be you and I. So the gospel has been passed down. The disciples took it out. They evangelized. They took Jesus' mission seriously. The Holy Spirit empowered them with gifts and um, with, with the promise of, of what he said he would do through them. They did greater things than Jesus did, and he actually said that. You will evangelize in a way that I've never been able to do um, because there are more of you, and I'm leaving, and you guys will be here. And so he, he says basically that the, the fruits of your labor, I want to bless all those people. So that includes you and I. So Jesus is technically talking to you here. So we could say it this way. I pray not only for these, but also for the people at LifePoint on April, what's today, 28th, 26th? I forget the date is. <clears throat> Who believe in me through their word. May they all <clears throat> be one. Now imagine the power if just all of us in this room were unified, not in like the same, thinking the same things, but thinking the same way. What if all of us just in this room were all unified in how we were going to treat each other, how we're going to behave, how, how we thought, um, the ways in which we think, our beliefs about Jesus Christ, our care for other people. If just the people in this room were unifying that and we took that out into the world, that would make a massive, massive dent in how challenging the world is to live in. And so they said, I hope all of them will be one just as you, Father, and I, uh, you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. I've given them the glory that you have given me. So Jesus has passed on the glory that God has given him. He's given them the good news. He's given them life. He will give them his Holy Spirit so that they may be one <clears throat> as we are one. Now, Jesus doesn't literally mean that we are going to be like the Trinity, like God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But he's using this to say we are so unified, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that it's a model for Christians to be so unified in purpose that they may be like 
us. So I am in them, and Jesus is talking to the Father, and you are in me so that they may be made completely one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Now, there's a really big implication here that we can't gloss over and, and move forward to uh, too fast. And we say this all different ways. And my, my, the way I like to say it the most is Jesus, people see Jesus. Gosh, I can't even say my own sentence. People will see you before they see Jesus. And that's really important because for most people, they will judge people's beliefs based on their behavior. And they will judge whether or not giving their life to Jesus is worthwhile based on who you are and how you treat other people. And so what Jesus is essentially saying is, man, if Christians could be united in their purpose and their behavior and the way that they think, because God the Father and I and the Holy Spirit are all united, that would be a witness to the world that something is unique with them. Because religion tends to divide people, and a relationship with Jesus tends to bring them together. And so when Jesus' last, one of his last prayers is, he's like, the world is watching you guys. And if you disciples, you 12 disciples, if you fight amongst one another, the mission is going to end before you even begin. And then if you give it back to the generations afterwards, if Christians around the world do not treat one another with love and respect and care and use their giftings for God's glory, the world watches. And it's going to be a bad witness for Jesus Christ. So he, he gives this incredible prayer that even those 12 guys, like they had issues internally. And they're like, you want to take this to all generations? Good luck with that. It's challenging. But it does happen. And Jesus gives them this mission, and they go off and they begin to build the church, which is both exciting and incredibly, incredibly complicated. One of the guys who realized this really well is the Apostle Paul, because as he was going around the world and as he was planting churches, he was trying to help people be unified. I mean, Christianity was a new world religion at this point. So in some places it wasn't legal. Some places it was mistrusted. They were called atheists. There was all sorts of skepticism, maybe similarly to how it is today. Why would I go to church on Sunday? Why would I believe in your God? Why would I do all this sort of stuff? And, and Paul understood all of this. And so he begins to write letters, and in one of them he writes to a church in Ephesus because he wants them to understand the power of unity and the reason for which they believe and gather in the way that they do. Now before we get there, two things real quick. If you are not a Christian, either when you're watching online, watching this later, or you're in this room today, today's message is only for you in the sense that I hope that you will nod your heads, and I hope that you will say, I wish Christians did the things that you just said. I hope Christians believe believe these things and are internally with one another, I, I hope they treat each other well. But if you are a Christian, this is a mandate. Meaning Jesus says, if you don't represent me well, if you don't, you know, with other churches and with other Christians, if you don't do this well, the world is watching. And just in a personal manner, one of the ways that myself and the other pastors in this valley have tried to contribute to this idea of unity is we meet together regularly and we talk about both the great things that are happening in our churches, our struggles. And I'm going to name some of them for you. Uh, um, I just got to meet with some of the men's group from Redemption Church where Pastor Stephen is there in Carson City. Love that guy. We get to play golf every once in a while. Um, Derek Carpenter over at Common Ground, also in Carson City. Him and I get to have breakfast. Sometimes we gather with other pastors. Dusty, and they just planted a campus, Life Church in Carson City. We love them and what they're doing and his wonderful wife, Christy. We get to see them uh, at track meets and other stuff like that. Um, I've met Pastor Rich over at High Sierra Fellowship. There's a new church plant coming in town. My wife and I are going to try to have dinner with them. And I don't want you to be impressed by that. What I want you to see is we have to work at unity within the, the, within the community. Because sometimes it's even hard to say that churches compete against each other. And that is ridiculous because we're all on the same team. Because we want to be unified and build, as Pastor Derek often says, kingdoms over castles. We're just one of God's churches, and me and the other pastors meet because we care deeply about unity within this valley. So Ephesians 4 Chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, Paul talks about this kind of unity. He says, Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a wor uh, urge you to walk worthy of the calling that you have received. Now, Paul is talking to the Christians in Ephesus at this particular church, but it would be easy to see him talking to us as well. So with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, make every effort, every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond 
peace. You know, there are all sorts of things that help detract us. I've already said this is an election year, and we're going to see it on social media, and people who are once, once friends and loved ones and family members, we're going to miss this peace for a while. It's a little sad, because we should be unified in the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins, and he bodily resurrected, and he gave the church a mission, and he's given us his unifying Holy Spirit, and he has asked us to represent him to the world. And I'm going to make this practical to the end uh, for you guys. Right now, we're looking at Scripture, but I'm going to give you four things to do at the end of today's message. He says, there is one body and one spirit, just in case people misinterpret what Paul is trying to say, because Paul is not the only person helping plant churches. He's not the only leader in the church. James uh, and Peter are in, the, in Jerusalem. Paul is being sent to the Gentiles. The church is figuring out how it's supposed to function in a large geographic area. And they don't have texts, and they can't call one another, so they send letters, and this is one of them. But Paul wants people to understand how unifying they should be through Jesus Christ, because there is just one spirit, just as you were called to one hope, <clears throat> one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. Paul is essentially saying, there may be some peripheral things. There may be how you baptize people. Maybe you're more of a dunking than a sprinkling. Maybe you have talked about the gifts in a different way in different churches. But if you don't realize and, and, and make sure that this is the backbone and the center of your faith, unity is going to be impossible. And so he, he's appealing to Christians everywhere, especially to the church in Ephesus. Don't forget, we are unified by all of these things. And he himself, Jesus Christ, gave himself some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. Now, you've, you've heard that I've seen here uh, that I've bolded three of these. And I'm just going to talk about me for a second real quick. So there, there were five offices, and I say word were because I believe two of these offices no longer exist. Uh, part of the reason I got there is that apostles, I believe, were people who had to be around during the time of Jesus. They had to be around um, or picked uh, personally by him, and they had to be picked by the apostles because they were with him the whole time. Acts uh, chapter 1 talks about that, uh, so at the end of the Gospels. And so I believe the apostles were for a certain time. Now, apostle just means sent, someone who is sent. So I think someone can have an apostolic ministry, but I'm not sure that there are apostles. In fact, personally, I don't believe that there are apostles anymore. And there's a specific reason for, for that. Um, and prophets as well. I believe probably the last prophet was probably John. That as God gave prophets his words and communication to the world, that the gift of prophecy is probably still around. And that's communicating God's viewpoint, not only in the present, it's insight, hindsight, and foresight, in my opinion. And so I don't think those two offices exist anymore. But I do think that the next three do. I do think that we still have the office of evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And the reason this is so important, at least to me, and I'm just speaking on me, not everyone in our church, is this, is that spiritual gifts and offices, spiritual gifts and offices are not a way of measuring importance. Can we put the next one up for, for me? Thank you. Spiritual gifts and offices are not a way of measuring importance. They're God's way of directing service. And my opinion, when I said this in the first gathering, so I'll say it to you as well, is that any person who does either what I do or has one of those offices and loves the office more than they love service, you should run the other direction. You should not be, again, in my opinion, at a church, listening to, under the authority of, someone who loves the office more than they love the service that comes with that office. Because pastors and evangelists and teachers, their job and my job and the wonderful pastors and people at our church, our job is to serve God with the office and the abilities and talents and spiritual gifts that God has given us. That's what we should do with them. So Paul says, what do those offices provide? What's their job? Sometimes I get this question. It's like, don't you only work on Sundays? It's like, yeah, that's what I do. I just work on Sundays, just one day a week. But what, what do pastors do? I mean, people who aren't Christian are wondering, like, what do you do? Like, I understand the teaching point. I understand maybe going to hospitals and doing funerals. What do you do? And sometimes I'll turn to a scripture like this, and I'll paraphrase this. But since we're in church today and we're reading through scripture, we're going to go through the whole thing. 
So Paul essentially says, hey, what do these offices do? What are they supposed to do? And he gives a list, and I'm going to number these for you. The first one is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, some people think that that's a paid pastor or director or coordinator's job. You're employed by the church. Your job is to do the ministry. And in fact, the Bible does not teach that. Our job is to equip all of you to do the ministry. And there's a very simple reason for that. If it was just the paid people on staff who did the ministry, our impact would be about this big. But when we equip all of you to do the ministry, using the spiritual gifts and talents and experience that you have, the multiplication of ministry and effectiveness in the world just skyrockets. And so Paul's insistence upon people who do kind of like what I do or Pastor Fred or Tracy does or Pastor Roy does or any of our directors do is that we're supposed to equip the people for the work of ministry. The apostles discovered this early on. So when the church started, they were trying to teach, they were trying to evangelize, they were trying to take care of orphans and widows in their distress. Uh, They were trying to um, heal people. They were trying to go out to other cities and they realized they could not do it all. And so eventually they got together, they prayed about it and they said, we believe God has called us to teach and to evangelize and do a few other things. And we're gonna hand a lot of these other ministries off to volunteers and to people we believe God is gifted to do that. So that's number one, is our, our, our job is to equip you to do ministry. Number two is to build up the body of Christ. I've never met anyone in my life who couldn't use encouragement. And I, to be honest, I'm not a natural encourager. You can ask anybody on my staff, does he encourage you enough? I know the answer. The answer is no. And I try to do this uh, a lot better. I set reminders for myself. I put it on my calendar. I know it's embarrassing, but I'm just being real with you, is that I'm not a natural encourager. But I know that my staff and the volunteers and people need that. And everyone in your life needs it too. And so Paul is essentially saying the body of Christ needs it just like everybody else, to be built up, to be encouraged. Number three, until we all reach unity in the knowledge of God's Son. Knowledge is important when it comes to faith because what you believe and think about is how you behave and what you build your life on. And the reason this is so important is that Paul, the apostles, and especially Jesus said that what you believe about God matters. And so what happens is in a church, our job is to teach you based on scripture, not based on our experiences or what we like about the Bible, is that we have to open up the word and say, here's what God says. Here's what we need to help you interpret or understand or put into practice. And that's part of the reason that we invite people uh, to critique us from time to time. You can email Roy at any time if you'd like to, if you want to critique one of the messages. He loves those messages. So... We really want to teach you from the Bible because that is where good teaching comes from, not from a person. And number four, growing into the maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. No one likes to be told that their faith is immature. In fact, telling someone you're immature is often a derogatory statement. You're so immature. And I'm not saying that about any of you. But our job, according to Paul, is to help people grow in their faith. It's okay to be childlike. It's not okay to be childish. Childlike faith is wonder and awe and learning and leaning in and looking with wide-eyed fascination at how you can grow. And childlike faith is turning away, is not listening, is not, not doing anything with it. It's hearing something but never doing anything about it. And so part of our hope is to help you mature in your faith as well. And Paul gives us the reason that these things are so important. Then, if we do these things, then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness uh, in the techniques of deceit. I mean, Paul's just commenting on if you are a Christian in the world... And there are times when you go, things are great, things are not great. I'm super stressed out. Everything's under control. If you constantly do this, in my opinion, based on what Paul is saying, it means maybe your hope and your faith isn't as strong as you think it is. Or maybe my hope and my faith isn't as strong as I think it is. And this happens sometimes. Sometimes when we think, man, the economy is bad, where is God? The economy is great, God is with us. Oh man, the person I voted for didn't make it into the White House, God didn't want that. Oh, my person made it into the White House, God is clearly for him. And we just go back and forth and back and forth. And in my opinion, in my opinion, Christians should be the most rock solid people 
in the world when it comes to engaging with world events, with culture, and with anything that happens. Your friends, people who don't know Christ, should be and probably are the people who wildly swing from side to side. But what a gift it would be if your non-Christians would come to you and you just say, hey, it's going to be okay. And you don't have to be weird about it. God's in control. Get a life. Don't do that. That's weird. (laughs) Don't do that. But you could have your beliefs and showcase it to them and in your heart go, I know things aren't good, but I know God is. Or I know things are great and God's still good. And I'm not sure who's calling right now, but I hope it's an important (laughs) one. Just kidding. I don't want to make you feel bad. It may be a really important phone call. So I'm not sure, but if your friends and your people who do not know Christ saw you modeling patience and calmness and just such great faith, you will possess something that they don't have. And I think that's what Paul is saying here, is then when we do all of those things, when we're mature and all that sort of stuff, then we have a way to deal with the fluctuations of life that other people don't. So he says, from him, the whole body fitted and knitted together, fitted and knitted together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. Here, Paul is using an analogy of a body. He's basically saying, imagine if parts of your body just refused to do the things that they were supposed to do. Imagine your mind just like, I'm not going to think about anything more. Or your feet are just like, you know, I'm kind of tired. I'm not going to walk for a week. It would affect how and what you could do. And Paul uses as analogies, he says, imagine Imagine the body of Christ, the gathering of believers. Let's just use our church, for example. Imagine people at LifePoint just said, I'm not going to use my gifts. I'm not going to volunteer. I'm not going to encourage. I'm not going to have like this faith in God. It would affect our church to a negative degree. And some of you have answered that call and said, I will volunteer, I will give, I will use my talents, I will be here, I will encourage, thank you so much. And there are still many of you who we encourage you to do so. And so I'm going to give you four ways, four next steps to talk about unity and diversity in our community, the community of believers here. Four things that you can do. I want to give you four because I think you can do at least one of them this week, and I hope you do. So here are some next steps. The first one is to get equipped, to take a class, <clears throat> join a team, and for, pray for God to use you in the local church. Now, now, most of you have probably not seen my resume, and most of you probably don't know what I did before this. I've been a pastor for a while. I have, if you looked at my resume, there are several short stints on my resume. One of them is about a year, and they're very simplest reason. Anytime you look at someone's resume, you're like, why didn't you stay there that long? And the reason I didn't stay there this long is that I realized that I really wanted to teach. And I believe that God has gifted me with the gift of teaching. That's not bragging, and most of you know that because you're like, we know you personally, you're not that great. But what I'm saying is, is that I, I do think that if I didn't do this, I wouldn't be obeying God, and I would be a far more depressed version of myself. And I believe I'm trying to use the gifts that God has given me. Now, you have gifts and talents that I don't have. You have abilities, experience, spiritual gifts, awareness. You have things that we just don't possess that we really need. And my encouragement to you is once you do that thing, maybe something that you're passionate about or something that someone says, you know, you're just naturally gifted at this. Once you do that thing in the local church, you'll discover why you were made. Seriously, you'll discover why God made you. And you'll do it and it won't feel like work. It won't feel like volunteering. It might even not feel like leading. It just feels like God has given you a gift and you're using it and you're seeing the fruits of your labor. So the first encouragement is if you don't know your gifts, take a spiritual gifts class. Ask one of us, ask how you can volunteer. Because not only does the church need it, we need you. And not only that, is that when you do what God has gifted you at in the local church, you discover why you were made. And that feeling is one of the best feelings in the world. Number two, encourage someone at church today and a fellow Christian every day this week. So please don't come up to me after this and say, good message, pastor. Don't do that. What I want you to do is I want you to turn to someone else. And I want you to find someone else in our church. And when you go home, I hope you'll encourage a Christian first because the Apostle Paul says, make sure to take care of the body of Christ first. And I hope you'll encourage someone else. 
It doesn't cost you anything to say kind words. And everyone needs it. Everyone needs someone who says, hey, you know, God loves you. And, you know, I love you. And I really value what you do. It has to be personal. It has to be specific. It can't be flippant. Take the time to look them in the eye, not in passing, but to tell them, I appreciate you and God appreciates you. What do you do for a living? You're a teacher? Man, the, the things you do for our kids, I can't imagine that. You are gifted in that. I am so glad that you are teaching the next generation. Or if you're a doctor, thank you so much for helping people get healthy again. What you do, man, you must have gone through so much schooling and there must be so much stress in your job. They just want to be seen and heard. Encourage someone. Number three, read John 17 about unity in the church. We need to be reminded of that. Sometimes, and I've seen people in this church and in another's church fight about silly things, the color of the carpet, what someone said, whether or not their ministry got done, or other things. But realistically, the first and primary thing that Jesus asks us to be is to be unified, to all have oneness and purpose through him. And if we can do that internally, then when you leave this building, you'll have practiced it, and hopefully you can do it with other Christians, because the world is watching. They're watching your marriage. They're watching you at work. They're watching you when you're away from church. And I hate to say this because I was one of those people. They're judging and measuring whether your faith is genuine and whether they should join based on your life. It's unfair, or maybe it is fair, because if you've chosen to be a disciple of Jesus, you've chosen to have a public faith. Your beliefs may be private, but your faith never is. And so maybe it's unfair, but read this again and say, how can I be unified with my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? And just on a personal note, real quick, is that, you know, I'm, I'm closer with many of you than I am with my own biological family. And part of the reason is that is that we share an eternal destination. And my hope is that someday my family and my friends and people I know and love and care about come to know and love Jesus. But for many of you who already know and love Jesus, I know I'm going to see you in eternity, which is why I invest in relationships here, which is why I care about you and our staff cares about you. And we want to be unified in purpose and in love and encouragement. Because if we don't like each other now, imagine being neighbors for eternity, right? It's just bad. So we might as well get this right here. And then number four, Mature in your faith by taking your next step. Everyone has a next step, including me. I've been a pastor for 15 years. I've got multiple degrees. I'm always learning. I'm always, I learn things from middle schoolers and people who are 100 years old. I love learning that. I'm continuing to take my next steps because until Jesus comes back, I'm a disciple of Jesus, just like you are. And so I hope you'll take your next step. For some of you, it's getting baptized. For some of you, it's volunteering for the first time. For some of you, it's giving. For some of you, you've never been in a group. For some of you, you've never shared your testimony. You don't read maybe regularly. Those aren't guilt trips. They're just examples of next steps that you can take. And when, this is my personal belief, when you take your next step in faith, I believe God honors and rewards you for that. I don't think it's always financial. It's oftentimes relational. But I think as you move towards God, he moves towards you. And I believe he honors you in those choices. So let me pray for us. And I got three things to say real quick and then we finished. Hey, Father, thank you so much. We could have chosen so many places in scripture to talk about the importance of unity. Lord, we couldn't do it without your Holy Spirit. And maybe we don't talk about him enough. That if it was up to us, Lord, we'd mess a lot of things up. Lord, I just ask that in this church today, as many churches are meeting today, in this valley and beyond, that your spirit unites us for this valley. If we can just make an impact here, we'd have a generational impact. You know, your 12 disciples did so much for the world. Can we do that in this valley and beyond? Lord, I pray that you help us examine our lives so that we may be aware that people, if we are Christians, are watching us. The way we parent, the way we work, what we talk about, our marriage, and everything else. Lord, give us unity with you so that we may be a great witness to people who do not yet know and love you. And Lord, just help us continue to take our next steps. Give us the courage to volunteer, to give, to share our testimony, to be able to give back to the local church, to take a class, to join a group, to be on a team, and to use what you have given us in the local church to bless the body of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.
Three things real quick. Next week, we're going to start off on our Revelation series. I invite you to bring a notebook or something. We're going to go through a lot of information. You'll want to take a bunch of notes. It'll be really impactful to you. You can go to the next slide. We also have a night of missions coming up on May 3rd. I want to tell you about two things. One, uh, food is free, which is what gets me almost anywhere. And number two, uh, we would love for you to register. Please tell us that you're coming before so, so we can prepare for you. And then thirdly, we have a family meeting right after this. If you want to know a little bit about our finances, what we're doing, the great things that happen, meet some of our leaders and hear about our ministries, we invite you to stay. Thank you so much. You were already blessed in Christ. Have a great Sunday. Thanks.